There have been so many proposed explanations as to why the Red Bull RB19 has been so dominant this season. Is most of the performance from Adrian Newey's extensive experience with ground effect cars? Is it a stalling beam wing? Is it quadruple DRS? Or does it maybe have something to do with a very particular set of suspension characteristics that Red Bull seem to be exploiting more than other teams this season? In Monaco, Mercedes introduced their upgraded W14B, which featured actual side pods, but it also came with a new front suspension design that has gone more towards Red Bull and the fact that it has more anti-dive. Could this unlock the missing performance that Mercedes desperately need? But really, what exactly is anti-dive and why is it so interesting? We can't really begin to explain anti-dive without first talking about the suspension of a car. The suspension's job is to help isolate the chassis from bumps and irregularities in the road and help control the load on the tires for handling. In road car applications, one of the primary focuses of the suspension is to ensure that there's a good ride quality in terms of driver comfort. But as we move towards more performance applications in road cars, the emphasis shifts towards handling and performance at the expense of riding comfort. Then when we get to racing applications, we're really not so much concerned with the driver's comfort. We just want to get the most out of the tires and ensure that the car is in the right attitude or ride height range to generate downforce. But there are limits. Now, in general, we'd like to make the suspension as soft as possible. And this is great for making sure that the tire can always stay stuck to the ground and generate grip as it goes over lumps and bumps. And this is one aspect of the idea of mechanical grip. But with Formula One and most cars that produce downforce, we do need to make some compromises. As we've talked about before, downforce increases proportional to the car speed squared. So the faster we go, the more force is pressing down on the car. And then the more the suspension compresses. And at some point, the car will hit the ground. Now, the levels of grounding that we see in Formula 1 cars is dictated by the rules, which prohibit the floor from wearing more than a certain amount. And we talked about it a lot last year, but these titanium skid blocks cannot wear more than one millimeter. And they're deliberately made out of titanium, so they make cool sparks, especially in night races. So the consideration is now that we need to trade off our ride height and our suspension stiffness. So if we go super soft on the suspension, we've got a nice comfortable ride and we've got lots of mechanical grip, but we also have to increase the ride height of the car so it doesn't end up smashing into the ground. And then higher ride height is bad as this moves the center of gravity higher among a few other things. Or we could run the car super low and super stiff at the expense of mechanical grip. And some circuits are just super bumpy so you cannot get away with running insanely stiff. But there's actually a third thing to consider now. The aerodynamics of a Formula One car are very sensitive to ride height. A few millimeters of front or rear ride height could have a profound impact on the downforce the car can generate. This means that we need to keep the car in the correct ride height window when going through corners. And this is what people mean when they refer to the idea of platform control or they talk about a car's operating window. It's literally the relative position of the car's body to the ground. So we've got a few things to consider. We've got ride heights for cornering and for aero. We've got ride heights for bottoming and grounding, and then we need to make sure the suspension isn't so stiff that the tires are skipping across the tarmac instead of generating grip. And since this whole video is about anti-dive, we have one more thing to consider. Braking and accelerating cause load transfer. Load transfer under braking increases the load on the front axle and reduces the load on the rear. So the front suspension will compress and the rear will extend under braking. Now, on the brakes, smashing the front of the car into the ground is a great way to, well, not brake particularly well. And F1 cars generate a lot of braking force over 5G. So this whole anti-dive, just from the name of it, sounds like it could be pretty useful. So if you put 100% anti-dive on the car, you have the best Formula One car. Thank you for watching the video. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. Everything in motorsport is about compromise, but let's keep digging because this gets really interesting. In order to see how important anti-dive is for platform control, we need to elaborate on another concept. Now, we just introduced the concept of operating window, so what exactly is that? In short, the operating window is one way to describe the ride heights in which your car produces the most downforce, or is well balanced. The last few generations of Formula One cars have a few things in common. The front of the car tends to make more downforce at lower front ride heights. When you put aerodynamic shapes close to the ground, such as a front wing, this tends to exaggerate the amount of downforce due to a thing called ground effect. Now, this term is also used to describe cars that generate a lot of downforce by operating their floor and diffuser close to the ground. The rear of the car isn't that straightforward. We've got a rear wing, we've got a beam wing, we've got a diffuser, and all sorts of interactions from the front of the car passing down to the rear of the car. In general, if the rear of the car is too low, the diffuser can be choked or stalled, which can cause abrupt losses in downforce. Does anybody remember porpoising? Also, if the rear of the car is too high, the downforce starts to fall away. So the rear of the car has a very specific operating window or even a peak that it wants to operate at. And I'm a visual guy, so let's make an attempt to draw what this looks like. Now, these aren't any car in particular. These are just kind of a generalization of these concepts. 
Here is the front lift coefficient versus front ride height. You can see that front downforce tends to increase the closer we get to the ground. And then here's the rear lift coefficient versus rear ride height. This, as we described above, has a peak or a window, and we want to operate the car here as much as possible because that'll give us the most downforce. In reality, it's a lot more complicated than this, but this simplification is absolutely perfect for explaining the whole anti-dive situation. So let's put all this together to understand how anti-dive impacts a car's performance and operating window. Formula One cars tend to run quite stiff at the front and relatively soft at the rear. And in general, the front ride height range of an F1 car is probably around 30 millimeters or just over an inch, and the rear is somewhere around 80 to 100 millimeters, so about four inches. Now here's something a lot of people probably don't know. The 18 inch Pirelli tires introduced in 2022 are actually about the same vertical stiffness as the old 13 inch tires. So about half of the front ride height change still comes from the tires alone, and keep that in mind. So let's look at some examples of what's going on with the ride heights and our aero map. When the car is stationary, the ride heights are at their highest, and this is our setup ride height. Going through a low speed corner, the ride heights might be here as the suspension has compressed a little bit from downforce. Then when we go through a medium speed corner, there's more downforce and there's more compression. And then through a very high speed corner, the ride heights might be here, even lower still as the downforce is still increasing as we discussed before. Then we finally arrive at the end of a long straight and the ride heights are about here, but there's a corner coming up. The driver will smash the brake pedal and the front axle will compress further and the rear axle pops up slightly. So we have to leave enough front ride height so that the nose of the car doesn't end up buried into the tarmac. Now, regarding optimizing your ride heights, the two fundamental parameters that you have to play with are the stiffness and the setup ride height. The stiffness determines the size of the operating range, and then the ride height determines the part of the range that you're using. On the front axle, you tend to run as low and stiff as you can, but circuits like Monaco that are super bumpy require a softer front end and a higher front ride height. The rear bit is a little bit more interesting. When setting your stiffness, you not only need to consider how bumpy the track is, but then you have to make a compromise with that and your ride heights so that the rear of the car is in the operating window where most of the corners are. And now we can start talking about braking and anti-dive. You remember this little thing? This is how much the front ride height dips under braking. And what if I told you that we could get rid of it without making the front suspension stiffer? This means that we could actually lower the front of the car and gain some front downforce without making the mechanical grip worse in the corners. And this could be an advantage locked in for years, right? So we would do this with an anti-dive front suspension. Formula One cars use independent suspension on the front and rear of the car. The orientation of how the wishbones mount to the chassis has some interesting implications on how the loads are then passed back into the chassis and we want to talk specifically on the braking case. Braking forces at the contact patch between the tire and the road cause the car to decelerate. This deceleration then causes load transfer. This means that some of the weight of the car shifted from the rear axle to the front axle, and this will tend to compress the front suspension and extend the rear suspension. But we also have some interactions with the wishbones onto the chassis. And you're gonna to have to stick with me for this part because it'll make sense in just a second. So here's the McLaren from Miami. Both the upper and lower front wishbones are more or less parallel to the ground. And when the wishbones are parallel, this is an example of zero anti-dive. I can't tell that this car is exactly zero, but it looks relatively low. Now, this is the part that I need you to stick with me. If we look at the side of the car, we notice that the planes of the wishbones don't intersect. And a quick way to visualize this is to simplify the suspension into a single swing arm setup. And with the parallel wishbone case, we have an infinitely long swing arm. So if we were to draw the forces out, the braking force at the tire is reacted only along the chassis. There would be no vertical component. Now, if that doesn't make sense yet, let's look at another scenario. Here's the Red Bull RB19 from Miami. Look at the location of the rearward leg of the upper wishbone. If we were to draw this out, the plane of the upper wishbone is extremely inclined. So with clever positioning of the wishbones, we can actually transmit some of the braking forces at the tire vertically into the chassis. And this is what we mean when we talk about anti-dive. So if we do the swing arm simplification again, it ends up looking something like this. So if we apply a braking force at the tire, it generates a component of vertical force back into the chassis. The engineers can actually design the suspension such that this vertical force component into the chassis is equal to the load transfer force from braking. That means that we won't have any suspension compression as a result of braking. Another important thing to note is that this does not change the amount of load transfer. It just changes where the forces are going. And another thing to consider is that the anti-dive force is only present when there's a braking force. It's a reaction force. So why doesn't every team run, let's say, 100% anti-dive? Very high levels of anti-dive do have some downsides, and some of them are actually quite difficult to quantify. Part of the braking loads are now reacted through the suspension legs, 
which means the motion of heave or pitch under braking is no longer controlled by the springs or dampers. And another consideration that I can think of is that high levels of anti-dive also increase the loads in the suspension links that increases compliances or actually makes these components heavier as you have to beef them up to deal with the load. But even with the potential downsides, Red Bull are looking at something here, and it sounds pretty awesome as a concept, but is this Red Bull's secret weapon? With 100% anti-dive, you have no suspension compression from braking. But at the front of the car, nearly half of the ride height change comes from the tire squish, and the other half comes from the suspension. Now, it is possible to run more than 100% anti-dive. That means that the braking force could end up extending the suspension under braking to compensate for the tire squish. But I really don't think that's what they're up to. Let's work Work through an example. Let's say that Red Bull are running around 60% anti-dive while the rest of the field is running 30%. Is this a big difference? It's double, right? With zero anti-dive, some quick calculations suggest that the car should have about 4 millimeters of front ride height compression from the suspension alone during braking. 30% anti-dive would save 1.2 millimeters, and 60% anti-dive would save another 1.2 millimeters. Yes, the aerodynamics on an F1 car are very sensitive to front ride height, but one or two millimeters is not remotely close to a performance differentiator. So what's really going on here? Huh? Huh? What's that, Adrian? Yeah, you want the wishbones where? But that's like 80% anti-dive. We want a lot less than that. The rest of the suspension characteristics are absolutely terrible. You're telling me that the wishbones there is worth 10 points of downforce? Really? Yeah, of course I'd f the entire paddock for 10 points of downforce, but... Uh, could we lower the roll centers a little bit? Okay, forget I asked. You know what? You're right. All right, cheers. Anyway, and that's the sad reality for vehicle dynamics engineers and suspension designers in F1. They basically have to commit suspension war crimes because aero is so dominant. At the end of the day, small amounts of front ride height just tend to buy you a little bit of downforce or a little bit of balance. But in terms of suspension movement, anti-dive doesn't have that much authority on the front axle of the car, considering how stiff they run. And considering half the overall ride height change comes from the tires, anti-dive isn't really that big of a deal until you start running over 100%. But we haven't even looked at the rear of the car and nobody's talking about this. Considering the rear suspension travel is nearly three times that of the front, that means we have a little bit more authority with a reasonable amount of antis on the rear. And there's a few options worth mentioning here. The first concept is under braking, and this is called anti-lift. And this is the same concept as anti-dive, but on the rear. So under braking, we have load transfer, and the rear of the car tends to lift under braking. We can set up the rear suspension such that a braking force will tend to pull the rear of the car down. Let's go back to the diagrams here. Imagine you're braking into a medium speed corner and the rear of the car might want to pop up to here. But with some anti-lift, you could minimize this during braking to keep slightly more load on the rear of the car. The second set of antis are called anti-squat or pro-squat, and this dictates the behavior of the rear suspension under acceleration, not braking. Anti-squat would tend to prevent the rear of the car from squatting or compressing under acceleration, whereas pro-squat would encourage it. When accelerating out of a corner, the rear suspension would compress a bit from load transfer. With anti-squat, it would compress less, but with pro-squat, you could actually push the rear ride height lower while accelerating out of a corner to increase the downforce on the rear of the car. Of course, that depends entirely on your aero map characteristics, but it's just an idea. So what do we do with this information? Well, it really depends entirely on your aero map shape and where you expect to operate your car. Depending on the sensitivity of your map, one might find that anti-lift is good for keeping rear ride height closer to the peak under braking, or maybe pro squat is favorable for low speed corner exits when you're applying the throttle. Without a lot more information about the specifics of these cars, I can't do much more than introduce these concepts and try to help explain them. Anti-dive only impacts the car performance during braking, and from all the telemetry that I've looked at this season, Red Bull's braking performance is in line with the other relatively fast teams, and I don't think there's anything special here at all. Most of Red Bull's performance this season is coming from medium speed corners, high speed corners, and their straight line efficiency. And even if they are running substantially more anti-dive than other teams, in terms of performance, this is very likely to only be a small fraction of the tens of other things that Red Bull have absolutely managed to nail on their RB19. Honestly, I think the rear suspension is a lot more interesting in this regard, but it's just super hard to figure out what's going on here. Speaking of braking performance, if you want to learn more about how Formula 1 drivers are so good at braking and how the sophisticated braking systems work on these cars, you should check out this video I've left here. 